reason The Kill Room is uh, my first and certainly most overt uh, political thriller is um, it really boils down to the aspect of inspiration. I'm always looking for something that I think will make a, a good thriller, but it has to be a topic that falls into the category that I would call, with some immodesty, a diver book. And, and that is, it's very simple. Uh, it takes place over a short period of time. It has internal reversals in it so that, for instance, the good guy turns out, that we think is the good guy, turns out in chapter four to be the bad guy. And then maybe in chapter 25, turns out to be the good guy after all. Uh, it has three or four surprise endings, plural, because I like my surprise endings. Now, th there are not a lot of books uh, that can be written in that framework because, say, a legal case takes a long period of time. Most political shenanigans, of which there is a great deal of material there, uh, requires a more leisurely type of book. You have to look behind the scenes. At, here it would be the Houses of Parliament, for instance, or Downing Street. Um, in uh, America, of course, Congress and, and then local government as well. It doesn't really fit into the Deaver formula that I was referring to a moment ago. But then, inspiration. The incident that I know all your viewers are familiar with, the um, American assassination of the American citizen, Anwar al-Awlaki. Uh, he was a radicalized Islamist imam from, of all odd coincidences, three miles from where I live in Virginia, who moved to Yemen and was preaching jihad and inspiring people to go out and commit terrorist acts. The U.S. government decided to take this fellow out, which they did. It was a, a drone strike, which has been much in the news lately, and um, killed not only him, but his uh, associate and uh, apparently his internet guru, who was also an American citizen. And uh, I thought, now this is a political incident that is going to allow me to write the Deaver book, the fast-paced Deaver book. And so the, uh, the story is quite simple. My uh, fictional head of a fictional government agency, you notice I use those adjectives both rather quickly. Uh, I do make up a lot of stuff in this book and these are two, uh, one man and one institution I have made up. Um, they learn of a fellow named Roberto Moreno, who is not an Islamist, uh, has nothing to do with religious uh, terrorism, but he is vehemently anti-American, primarily in a um, economic uh, sense, and uh, uh, the, just hates the American hegemony in the Western Hemisphere, what, what, what is happening in Latin America primarily, and the untoward American oppression, primarily economic, but government as well, CIA-led, down there. And uh, he uh, apparently is uh, planning a, a horrific terrorist attack. The government, this fictional organization of mine, takes him out. And then they learn, oops, the intelligence was perhaps flawed, and although he is a despicable human being, nonetheless, he was planning a peaceful protest. Well, no apologies are forthcoming, of course, but even worse than that, uh, they continue to target other individuals a fact learned by a young idealistic prosecutor in New York City named Nance Laurel. And Nance thinks, I'm not gonna let him get away with this. The rule of law is paramount in America and these people have broken the rule of law. And even if Moreno um, did plan a terrorist attack, why does that give us the right to kill him preemptively? The American law system is set up so that if someone commits a crime, uh, or is caught in the commission of a crime, they can be stopped and tried. Um, but there's no, uh, there are no thought police there. If you're planning a, a crime and you're talking about a crime, uh, they, they can't arrest you for that. They certainly can't ex execute you without some kind of judicial involvement. And she brings the case. Well, she needs investigators. Hence, Lincoln, Rhyme, and Amelia, and they get on board, and then the book becomes a typical, very fast-paced Deaver story. I write um, for my fans, my readers. I am happy to write anything. Imagine, I get paid to make up stories for a living. I write fiction. I've done that full time now for about 25 years. And all I think about is what is going to make the reader happy. Now, I, I enjoy writing Lincoln Rhyme books. I enjoy writing standalone books. I enjoy writing uh, Catherine Dance novels, my other series character. But when fans email me, please, 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 more Lincoln Rhyme, 
That's why I write the Lincoln Rhyme books. So not only will this is this book, The Kill Room, about Lincoln Rhyme, but I'll be doing a book next year featuring Lincoln Rhyme as well. Mm. But in this one, I mean, it's, it's a bit different maybe because he actually gets out and about, as it were. Yeah. Um, did you, was that something the fans wanted, or was that something you felt he needs to do by now? Another brilliant question. The fans are um, kind of in league to get Lincoln more in the mainstream again. And, and for your, your viewers who aren't too familiar, Lincoln is a uh, quadriplegic. He's a forensic detective. He's a brilliant, brilliant man, sort of elements of Sherlock Holmes within him. And uh, nonetheless, he's paralyzed from the, the neck down. That makes it very difficult for him to get out in public in the sense that, you know, physically it's hard for a disabled person to navigate certain areas, especially crime scene work, but also one feels self-conscious uh, in a condition like that. And I've spoken to people in the disabled community and they say it's something they wrestle with uh, quite frequently. But my fans say, you know, time for Lincoln to, to get out there, get, get on with his life. And so in this particular book, I not only took him out of New York City, I took him out of the country, and uh, he has quite some adventures there. Whether he lives or dies, I'm not going to tell, but th there are some uh, suspenseful moments, let's say, on his journey overseas. A, a reader came up to me at one point in America and said, you know what I like about your, your books, Jeff? It, it's called the eighth of an inch factor. And I said, what, what do you mean by that? And he said, the book appears to be completely finished when there's still an eighth of an inch of pages left, which would translate into roughly, what, 50 pages or so. And yet the book's done. We know who did it. What could there possibly be? These are fiction books. There's no index. There's no appendix. What could there possibly be? So they keep reading and learn that, no, that ending was not, in fact, the ending. There's something else coming on. And then ideally, in the kill room, for instance, uh, I managed to get four twists in the last roughly 50 pages or so. Now that's a difficult thing to do. It drives me absolutely crazy. Sometimes I will spend eight months outlining the book. Uh, that's a full-time job. I, I do the research too, so it's not completely full-time job. And much of that is orchestrating uh, this twist upon twist upon twist and setting up the clues earlier in the story so that when readers come to, let's say, twist number three, they say, ah, I should have seen that because in chapter four, we met this character very briefly and they said something that didn't make a lot of sense, but that was explained away. Then I know at the surprise number two or three at the end of the book, that's why Deaver put that in. Now, curious phenomenon about the ebook is that um, you don't necessarily know how much more you have to go. And there's a little icon down at the bottom, I think, that gives you an idea of that. But I think with the uh, ebook, although the surprises are just as valid, we may not have that milestone to let us know that something is up. My influences in writing are divided pretty evenly between books and movies. Uh, I grew up reading. My parents had a curious rule in the uh, household that my sister and I, even at a very young age, could read any book we could get our hands on, which in theory included Henry Miller, uh, although, you know, frankly, at six, I would have no clue what on earth he was writing about and would find it incredibly boring. At 14 or 15, I could return to Henry Miller and en enjoy the writing much more, I will say. Um, so as a result, uh, uh, reading was encouraged, and I, I did read many, many adventure stories that might seem a bit, a bit, um, uh, mature for a reader of young years, and that would include, say, the Ian Fleming books, uh, Dashiell Hammett, Raymond Chandler, uh, as well as tried and true uh, novelists, for not necessarily for children, but of all ages, Agatha Christie or Sherlock Holmes, which really appealed to a broad base of, of ages. At the same time I was reading those stories, I was going to the movies. I was an avid moviegoer. And what I took away from films, and I'm speaking primarily of Hollywood films now, um, although many Ealing Studio films as well from the great era of, of, of British cinema back then, was the sense of story told in a very economical way. A filmmaker had at the time, take a Hitchcock film, 90 minutes to tell a complete story with multiple plots and lots of surprises, often if it was a, a well done film, some were more linear than others, but, but nonetheless, that's a very small palette to work with. And um, I like this idea that every word, or in the case of a movie, every scene, um, every 
a uh, bit of action counted. There could be nothing gratuitous. Or if there was, it, we, we recognized, even as a young uh, film goer, I recognized that there was something faulty about it. That has been true to my approach to books. My first drafts tend to be about 200 pages longer than the uh, final version because I put in too much. And that would be akin to a, a filmmaker uh, putting out a movie, oh, can you imagine, over two and a half hours. Who on earth would do that? Well, just about every filmmaker nowadays. And I don't think we need three-hour action-adventure films. I think we need to trim down and be a, a bit leaner. Uh, that's one element of how films influenced me. The other is that I'm not a big fan of narration in films. I'm a fan of the uh, story being revealed through action and dialogue to some extent, of course. Uh, that, can, uh, that, that certainly is necessary. And I'm also a, a fan of the emotions being revealed in what characters say and do rather than having someone in third person voice said he felt bad. I would rather see him look bad. I would rather see the expression of it. So he feels upset, painful, embarrassed, something like that. So movies influenced me in that sense. Um, but nonetheless, uh, good, solid uh, literary storytelling is uh, just a wonderful, uh, wonderful delight and has the advantage of another love of mine, which is the written word. Uh, putting words together is, to me, a great pleasure. Having been an attorney, I can safely say I was not a very good lawyer. I, I handled one case. I did mostly corporate law, but I handled one case, which I did win. It was a trial where we were sued by an employee. And I felt so guilty that I won for uh, the, the case representing a large, heartless corporation against this young plaintiff uh, I, that I, I said, I just don't have the heart for this. But what law taught me was two things that have been very helpful in my, uh, in my writing career. One is how to research in the sense that um, you never go into a case or a corporate deal, business deal, without knowing everything there is to know about not only your side and your client, but the other side as well. Everything is written down, everything is studied. Uh, the same with a, a novel, this idea of I sit down with a blank screen and somehow the muse reveals the story to me. Well, that's nonsense, you, you make it up, but you have to do the work, you have to get sweaty palms, you have to think hard. And the only way you can do that is to do your homework, do your research, do your outlining, put all that together. Law also helped me in, a, in another sense in that when you write a legal brief, uh, the court does not want flowery language. The court does not want lyricism and pyrotechnics in the prose. They want something that can be read by a lay person, you know, barring the some terms of art that have to be in a legal document. And the, the, the individual who reads it says, oh, I get it. They don't look at a paragraph and say, wow, that is such great style. Look at those metaphors, look at that. I have no idea what it means. Well, maybe I better go back and read it two or three times for that. You don't have the luxury of that in legal writing. Uh, you, you have to tell the story in a very, uh, uh, you know, frankly, pedestrian way. But that is what this business is all about, uh, telling the story, getting the idea from my mind into the minds of the readers as uh, simply as possible.